How's it going everybody? I'm back and today we're going to be starting a new series where I create paleo profiles for different species from ages past. I still plan to continue my museum adventure series as well, but one thing I've wanted to create for this channel is going to be like a catalog of different animals and give people just some basic information about them. And for our first segment of this series, I feel the best place to start is with one of the most famous prehistoric mammals. With a face famous enough that we actually decided to make its skull the logo for our channel, Smilodon, the saber-toothed cat. Considering how well known Smilodon is, there's a lot that people actually don't know about this incredibly unique and specialized animal. For one thing, it's been given the nickname Sabertooth Tiger, implying that this creature was simply a tiger with big teeth. Under closer examination, however, it's clear that this is a very different animal than anything alive today, even when comparing it to other cats. It was definitely not a tiger, and probably didn't even have stripes. It was actually a much more bulky animal than modern cats. It was around the same size as a lion or a tiger, but built more like a bear, with powerful shoulders and a short bob tail. This heavy frame allowed it to hunt big animals like bison, camel, and horses. However, because of its stocky body and short tail, it wasn't as fast a runner as many other modern cats. In cats that are particularly good runners like cheetahs, a long tail acts as a counterbalance that allows them to change direction easier while running. Because of these differences in anatomy, scientists believe that Smilodon was much more dependent on ambush to hunt its prey. Now, all cats are good ambush hunters, but because of Smilodon's build, it couldn't go on long pursuits of animals. It needed to use that energy to wrestle other animals to the ground and overpower them. And the reason why these cats are so different is because they're actually from a completely different branch of the Felid family tree. They're part of a subfamily called the Mecharodontinids. This group first appeared in Africa in the early Miocene around 16 million years ago. This means that the last time that a saber-toothed cat actually shared a common ancestor with any cats, whether it's a domestic house cat or a lion, tiger, or leopard, was that long ago. At that time, the earth was beginning to cool, and the ancestors of many different herbivore species that we would recognize today were starting to grow larger. In response to this, early saber tooths grew larger as well and started to grow longer upper canines. And this was obviously a good strategy. Because at the same time, another group of unrelated carnivores called the Barbarophilids were evolving saber teeth independently. This is a phenomenon called convergent evolution, where two unrelated species basically evolve to be very similar to one another because of similar ecological pressures. It's a subject that I find very fascinating, and some of my favorite animals fall into this phenomenon, and I feel like it might actually warrant its own video in the future just about this topic. But in the case of the Macarodontinids and the Barbarophilids, them evolving so similar strategies at around the same place and time put them in direct competition with one another, as well as competing with the ancestors of the modern cats that are around today. All three groups would spread out of Africa and then into Eurasia and eventually North America. And then once they arrived there, all three groups of cats would meet all the North American carnivores that had evolved independently from them, including what would become their longtime rival, the dogs. With so many predators around, North America probably looks something like the African savanna today. All this competition was eventually too much for many species. And by the late Miocene, around 9 million years ago, several different groups, including the Barbarophilids, had gone extinct. Going into the Pliocene, the saber-toothed cats would continue to refine their abilities as predators and adapt into different forms. Now, there are different other species of Macarodontid saber-toothed cats. However, for this video, we're going to be focusing on the different species that fall within the genus Smilodon, of which there are currently three. The smallest at about the size of a jaguar was Smilodon gracilis, weighing up to 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. This species has been found primarily across the southeast of the United States. 
However, it's now believed that it may have been the direct ancestor to the other two species. Smilodon fatalis appears to have been the most widespread and abundant, living across North America and even into Central America. It grew to around 280 kilograms or 620 pounds. And the largest was Smilodon populator, the species that spread to South America once the land bridge formed between the Americas. Most estimates put it in the range of 220 to 400 kilograms or up to 880 pounds. But at least one specimen that has been found is believed to have been around 470 kilograms or over a thousand pounds. This would make it a contender for the largest cat that ever lived. So obviously this design of Hunter was extremely successful for a long time and allowed this group to spread across five continents. But for some reason, they don't exist today. And I feel like in order to get a better idea about why that might be, we're going to have to take a closer look at this animal. All right, so here we have a skull cast of Smilodon fatalis. This is the medium, I, I guess you could say medium. This is the lion or tiger sized animal. So it's larger than Smilodon gracilis and a bit smaller than Smilodon populator. I'm gonna try when I do these videos to have some of my different skull casts that I have been using for educational purposes for years and presentations just to give everybody a little bit more of a hands-on approach to actually looking at the animal and getting some cool comparisons like here I have a modern leopard skull this is the only large conical tooth cat that I have I don't have a lion or a tiger to compare it to but it'll give me a good for one thing a good size comparison between these two animals because obviously this is quite a bit larger than this. The Gracilis would probably be pretty close to this, maybe even a little bit larger, but that'll give you an idea of the size difference between a modern leopard and a saber-toothed cat. And I'm gonna get him off of his stand now. So besides the obvious difference of the size of the animal, the other major thing that you'll notice is obviously that there is a very big tooth difference between these two animals. But it's more complex than just this animal had big teeth compared to this. In animals like leopards and lions and tigers, their teeth are round for the most part. You'll see they're almost as thick from side to side as they are from front to back. There's a little bit of a difference, but it's it's nothing when you compare it to an animal like this. Smilodon didn't just have long teeth, it had very flat teeth. That is something that both gave a lot of opportunity as a predator, as well as a lot of drawbacks as a predator. And the reason why is because think about the way that a cat, whether it's a lion or a leopard or a cheetah or a domestic cat, think about the way that this animal uses its teeth. A lot of times a cat like this would be doing something like going for either a muzzle bite or a neck bite, trying to break the neck of the animal or something like that. A leopard is able to do something like bite into a struggling victim like an impala or a zebra or a wildebeest or something like that. Smilodon would run into a lot of problems if they tried to use their teeth in the same way as an animal like this. Now, the first thing that I want to point out is that even though this thing has very large upper canines, that is, despite the fact that its lower canines have basically completely disappeared. Or if you look here at the number of incisors down here, this one's actually missing one lower incisor. So there would be three, there would be six, there would be six there. So there's three, six. So these teeth right here, these are actually the lower canines of Smilodon. They've basically become 
a, an extra pair of incisors in the front. It doesn't have lower canines because the thing about Smilodon is because of the fact that it had seven inch teeth, it had to open its mouth at like a 90 degree angle in order just to have enough clearance to actually get an animal past its teeth to be able to bite down. So right there is a huge difference because, you know, a, a leopard actually can't open its mouth at a, at a full 90 degree angle. This is not natural. It can maybe open its mouth to about there. So the issue that Smilodon would come into if it tried to do something like try to break the neck of an animal or try to bite into any kind of struggling prey at all was these teeth because of how much thinner they are in cross-section and because of how long they are, this also made the teeth extremely brittle. Because these teeth were so brittle, it had a hard time being able to bite something that was actively struggling because if it bit into something and there was any side-to-side -side movement whatsoever, these teeth had a very high possibility of breaking. And for this animal, that would be a death sentence. Maybe not immediately, it would probably be quite painful, but you have to remember, in animals like these, they only get two sets of teeth, just like humans. They get their baby teeth, and then they get their adult teeth. And if those adult teeth are gone, they don't get a replacement. So these teeth are needed for them to effectively be able to hunt and kill their prey and be able to eat. But if they lost these teeth, it would be a very bad situation for this animal. So how did Smilodon use these teeth, if not in the same way as an animal like a leopard. Instead of relying on using its teeth as its immobilizing weapon, it's believed that what this animal would do when it was hunting, that it would wrestle its prey, try its best to immobilize it, but was careful not to bite during the initial attack. Only once its prey was completely immobilized and pinned to the ground would it then open its mouth and then these teeth would come into play, probably going for a neck bite that in a single bite, if it was placed properly and if the animal was held down and unable to struggle, would likely sever the jugular veins, the carotid artery, the windpipe, everything. And basically it would rip out the throat of its prey. And considering Smilodon appears to have been an animal that became specialized in hunting big prey, because as it got bigger and bigger, and in cases like we've talked about with Smilodon Populator, possibly record-breaking size, they weren't able to chase down fast animals like deer or things like that. So they were focusing on the big animals. And in order to do that, there's actually theories out there that this animal may have been utilizing a strategy that is almost unheard of in cats. Pack hunting. And there's a lot of evidence for this that we'll talk about in a minute that Smilodon may have been a social predator, which makes the already terrifying animal even more impressive. Most of the evidence in support of this behavior has been found in a particularly amazing fossil site located in, of all places, downtown Los Angeles. The La Brea Tar Pits contains a more complete record of Pleistocene fossils than anywhere in the world. Literally hundreds of thousands of specimens have been uncovered here and continue to be found to this day. The reason why there are so many fossils here is because this location is the site of one of the most effective animal death traps ever known. The way that it worked was by the trap disguising itself by the one thing that all animals need to survive water. Rain would build up in pools on the more dense tar, and the tar would be covered up by leaves and other debris. And then animals in pursuit of fresh water would come down to get a drink at the seemingly safe watering hole, unknown to them that there was a trap set at the water's edge. Once an animal was mired in the tar, it was very unlikely they would ever get free, left to a slow death by exposure or starvation, and that's if they were lucky. If they were unlucky though, like many of them were, their calls for help would attract any number of the multitude of Ice Age predators that would come looking for an easy meal. You see, the American Serengeti was still alive and well in the Pleistocene, and although many of the faces had changed, it was still the same situation that had gone on for millions of years. North America was a land of super predators. The thing is, 
The tar pits did not discriminate between predators and prey. In fact, carnivores outnumber herbivores at the tar pits by 10 to 1. This is the opposite of what we usually see in nature. But because of the fact that the carnivores were being attracted to the pits by dead and dying herbivores, more carnivores would fall victim to the trap. For every one bison or camel that got stuck, an entire pack of dire wolves or an entire pride of lions would get stuck trying to feed on it. And this is where the evidence for Smilodon's social behavior would be discovered. You see, Smilodon fatalis is actually one of the most common animals found at La Brea. And many of these fossils show something very interesting. Injuries. Many of the bones show things like dislocated or broken limbs, injuries to the spine or shoulder, really debilitating stuff. And this is not surprising when you consider the lifestyle these cats were leading, as we've discussed before. The odd thing is the amount of bone growth on, on some of these injured bones could only have happened if the animal survived for months or even years after being hurt. And these injuries were more than enough to put Smilodon out of commission and unable to hunt. But the thing is, they still survived long enough to heal and eventually fall victim to the tar pits. And many people think that the only way that this could have happened, especially in the cutthroat world of Ice Age North America, was if these Smilodon had help from other members of their species. So Smilodon was a super predator that may have been social, and once was one of the most dominant carnivores in North America. Its ancestors clawed its way to the top, outcompeting many other predators. So what happened? Why are there no saber-toothed cats today, but conical-toothed cats remained? The best answer we really have, and you should remember this because there's a very good chance that I'm going to be saying this a lot during this series, is that this cat became too good at only doing one thing. This entire video, I've kept saying that Smilodon was hyper-specialized. There were excellent ambush hunters of large animals like camels, horses, and bison, and ground sloths, and young mammoths, but that was all they were good at. They were strong enough to pull down these massive animals, but they traded speed to get that strength. They were too big and heavy to chase deer, and even if they caught one on occasion, they wouldn't get enough calories to feed their heavily muscled bodies, especially if they had a dozen or so mouths to feed at every kill. And whatever the cause was, most of those big herbivores started to die out around 11,000 years ago. With all of its main prey gone, the saber-tooths couldn't adapt quickly enough to the changes. That's the unfortunate catch-22 in nature. Animals that become specialists tend to become the top predators because they are the best, but that only lasts as long as the environment stays the same. During times of great change, it's the generalists that inherit the earth. So there we have it, everybody. That was my deep dive into Smilodon and all we currently know about it. I really enjoyed making this one. As I said before, this was a series that I really wanted to make, and I guess now this makes two series on the channel. I have many more of these as well that I want to make, and also continue my museum adventure series. However, I'd love to get some suggestions from all of you. If there's a prehistoric creature that you would like to see me do a paleo catalog video for, comment below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. And if you haven't yet, I would love it if you subscribe. This channel is actually starting to pick up a little bit of momentum and I don't even know what to say. I, I am so happy just with even the small community that we've already created. And I love to have the opportunity to teach people. So thank you, all of you. All right, that's all I've got for today. Have a good one, everybody.